This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 86 was recorded on October 26th, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Convexity Maven founder Harley Bassman is probably best known for being one of the principal inventors of the Move Index, which is essentially the VIX for the bond market. Harley joins me for this week's feature interview, in which we'll discuss everything from Harley's thesis about the interrelationship between rates, credit, and volatility, to demographics, to the eventual return of inflation in coming years, and much, much more. Be sure to stay tuned, though, after the feature interview for our post-game segment, in which Patrick and I will provide extended crew oil market coverage, as well as getting into detail on some more option strategies. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 made a, a yet again an all-time new high earlier this week, but it seems to have rolled over in the last 48 hours. What's your thinking here on equities? Well, to be sure, a pullback of some kind is way overdue. And of course, there's a lot of people talking, saying, okay, the crash is on. It's possible, Patrick. You know, it is October, I suppose. It could still happen. But as I've said before, I think that the odds of a crash happening when so many people have predicted it is unlikely. I think a much more likely scenario is that there's no crash in October. And just as people are jumping for joy and celebrating that it was a false alarm, that's when something goes wrong. So, uh, you know, anything is possible. This was only, what, about a 1% pullback so far? And I guess we'll see what happens. But something I have been thinking about relative to this market, you know, we don't see any pullbacks hardly at all. And the market seems to be just going straight up in a straight line. How is that possible? Well, we've talked quite a bit on the program about this VIX short trade that everybody from the waitress at the uh, Applebee's restaurant to uh, the, the retired target manager who wants to start a hedge fund is is in. Think about what happens with that trade. All these people are shorting volatility. They're selling VIX futures and they're taking advantage of the contango yield by rolling those futures contracts forward. Or if they're doing it in the ETF, they're just letting the ETF do that contract roll for them. So the number is not changing so much. It's not like the number on the VIX is going down. It's capturing that term structure contango that's allowing that trade to profit for so many people. Well, what does that do? It creates this artificial massive supply of volatility, which you know, Patrick, is the key ingredient to options trading. So it makes me think about, is it possible that all these people selling the VIX short are basically suppliers of volatility that's creating cheap tail hedges that are allowing institutional investors to justify using much more leverage. And if you think about it, that would explain why we see this market continue to just march higher and higher if we have a lot of institutions and hedge funds that are suddenly comfortable using more leverage because they can buy the hedges they need in order to offset that leverage risk uh, at a cheaper cost because of all this cheap vol, that might explain this. Of course, the unwind of that would look really ugly. We're getting a little bit technical here for our market wrap, so I'd like to come back to this subject with you, Patrick, in the post-game segment because I know that you did a presentation in Vancouver a few weeks ago where you were getting into exactly this relationship between the volatility that's expressed by the VIX and the cost of options. So let's save that for post-game. I know you're going to be doing that again in Toronto. And by all means, anybody in Toronto in particular, don't miss the post game this week where we're going to get into more detail on what Patrick is going to cover at a conference there in the next couple of weeks. Aside from that, you know, I, I guess I'll just leave it on this point that I've made before. The stock market likes to make wise men look like fools. And I think that when we get to the point that the people who have expressed doubt about this market are being ridiculed publicly and everybody becomes so complacent that it just has to go higher, that that's when I really get scared, but I don't think we're quite there yet. All right, well, let's move on to that dollar index. And all I have to say is thank you, Mario Draghi, because that dovish taper uh, announcement uh, shot the U.S. dollar index higher here as the euro started plummeting. What's your take here on the dollar index? 
Well, not only did we get a spike up, but it took us very decisively through that head and shoulders, or I should say inverse head and shoulders neckline just above 94. So now we have, uh, unless there's a sudden retracement, which is possible when something like this happens on news, we've got a confirmation of that inverse head and shoulders pattern that should target probably up 96, 97, something like that. So far, you know, we're tracking on the story that I have favored, which is I think that we are going to see a resumption of the secular bull market. I think that the Luke Gromans and the Mark Yuskos of the world are definitely going to be proven right in the end. I just don't think we're at the end game yet. Mr. Trump is, of course, alluding to being almost ready to make his choice. It seems like his style on this Fed chair thing is going to be not to choose somebody, but to eliminate people. Every day he announces another person who's not under consideration. Seems like he's getting friendlier with Janet Yellen. So, you know, I'm going to wait for the nomination to see how to play that one. I think if there's anything that would reverse the this dollar breakout above the 94 handle, it would be a dovish surprise in terms of who gets the nomination for Fed chair. Remember, though, that no matter what the nomination is, a whole lot of people in Congress are going to fight any nomination from Donald Trump just because he's Donald Trump. So this could be a contentious Senate confirmation process as well. All right, well, let's move on to crude oil, where uh, once again, crude oil pushing to the top end of its ranges. It looks like that uh, 53 to 55 zone uh, where the highs of the year all were lying seems uh, a stone's throw away. What's your feeling here on oil? Yeah, well, as you called it, I think it was last week or the week before, it looks like we are probably getting that one last push up. We closed just barely above a key resistance level uh, today on Thursday, and it looks to me like we're targeting at least 5311, if not uh, 5376 would be the next target, and eventually you get into the 54 range. So I do think that we're probably headed towards higher oil prices. Let's start with inventory, though. Crude oil building 856,000 barrels a very small build, but a build in a week when most people were expecting a really big drawdown. Now, normally a build like that would be bearish, but look at the finished products. Holy cow, gasoline drawing down 5.5 million barrels, distillates drawing down 5.2 million barrels, and the distillates draw is particularly interesting because the distillates inventory was already critically low, so we're really getting to a supply contention problem with the marked drawdown in distillates. Remember, it is refinery maintenance season. As the refineries get through their turnaround process and come back up to full capacity, we should probably see some of these uh, finished products get built up again. And I think that that will lead to more drawdowns in inventory. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 237,000 barrels this week. Production back up above 9.5 million barrels. So we're basically fully back online, recovered from the hurricanes and uh, at pre-hurricane production levels. Exports are back up, though. One 1.924 million barrels per day. Multiply by seven, you get 13.5 million barrels of oil exported. That means that this 856,000 barrel build on inventories would have been a 14 million barrel build on inventories if we weren't exporting that oil. Now, the tape action and reaction to inventory was very confused. The market didn't know what to make of it. At first, it was up and then it was down and then it jerked up and then it jerked down. Then it drifted slightly higher and then it drifted slightly lower. But eventually the resolution to that was we ended up in the last couple of days trading higher. There's two more important issues about crude oil that are going to take some time to get into, Patrick. I think that the media in particular and a lot of analysts really have the story about backwardation in the WTI term structure wrong. And the other issue is the Brent WTI fallacy that so many people are talking about. It's really not the Brent WTI spread that you should focus on. It's the WTI in Cushing to LLS spread. I want to explain what all of that means, but it's a little bit too much for our market wrap. So let's save that for our post-game segment after the feature interview with Harley Bassman. All right, Eric. Well, let's move on to gold. Uh, now, when we look at uh, gold prices, like you know, there's always that intermarket relationship of uh, against the U.S. dollar on gold. But it's amazing to me how almost every day that uh, the dollar ticks up, gold ticks down, or vice versa, almost to the T. And obviously, with the big U.S. dollar break uh, out on the upside, that gold is once again under pressure to the bottom of the range. Where does gold look like it's going here for you? 
Well, I think you pretty much said it. What we're seeing is that very strong inverse correlation holding true. You know, we talked to Raul Paul six, eight months ago about a theory that maybe we could see the unusual circumstance where gold and the dollar rally at the same time. That We're not seeing that. What we're seeing is that as the dollar rallies, gold is taking it on the chin. I don't think that there's a play here to go long gold unless you have an opinion for some reason that you really expect a downside side surprise on the dollar index. With this kind of strength on the dollar, I'm holding off. I would like to buy gold. I think that the the day for gold is definitely coming, but I think we may have another big move down before we get to a a low, maybe even down to a a new lower low. What was the prior low? 1,025. We might even get below 1,000 if this dollar rally continues in earnest. I'm waiting to see, as far as I'm concerned, the jury's out on the dollar. I'm waiting to make a decision on gold until after I see what the dollar does. All right, well, let's move on to Treasury yields, where for the last six months, you know, that 240 level has actually been an overhead resistance. The May high, the July highs were all in there. And suddenly we get this big breakout in yields now, uh, you know, pushing north of 245. What's your thinking here on yields? I'm guessing that this has to do with speculation about who gets the Fed chair nomination. And that is a guess. I don't really have any strong opinion or reason to think that has to be it. But as I look around trying to come up with another explanation for what's driving this, what is it, 10 basis points in the last uh, week or so higher in yields, that's all I can come up with. We are still comfortably in that trading range, though. If we start to go above two spots, 64 on the 10-year yield, that tells me that maybe a new trend is in play. But at this point, I think we need to wait and see who gets the Fed nomination and particularly how the market reacts after that Fed nomination first. And then the next round is when we find out whether or not the nominated person is going to easily be confirmed or if they're going to face a really difficult confirmation process. And I think that might not be so much about the person who gets nominated, but just the conviction of a lot of people in Congress about opposing anything that comes from Mr. Trump. All right. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. And in this week's featured interview, Convexity Maven founder Harley Bassman will be joining us. Eric's interview with Harley is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Convexity Maven founder, Harley Bassman. Harley, I think some of our listeners may not be completely aware of your very extensive background in the industry. You were one of the principal designers and creators of the Move Index, which is essentially the VIX for the bond market, and held some senior roles at Merrill Lynch and PIMCO. So why don't we start with a little bit on your background and particularly how the Move Index came about. Thank you. Thank you for your time on the show. The move basically came out a year or so after the VIX uh, became obvious that volatility was becoming more and more important in the bond markets. Uh, people actually thought of volatility as an asset class to some degree. It's certainly one of the three main risk vectors being duration, credit, and volatility. I view myself as a convexity maven. Uh, I focus on volatility and that sort of risk. Duration is when you get your money back. Credit is if you get your money back. And uh, volatility, convexity is how you get it back. It's a path-dependent risk. And so creating the move was a way of basically uh, creating a a language for people to go and uh, look at volatility as an index as opposed to a number and um, say if it's high or low relative to uh, where it's been historically. And I believe you were at Merrill Lynch working on trading desks for about 26 years, and then you held a senior portfolio manager position at PIMCO. Tell us a little bit about what you did there at uh, the Bond King firm, so to speak. I was at Merrill 26 years. Uh, it was a terrific place, uh, a lot of opportunity. And uh, I focused on, uh, I was on the mortgage desk and uh, from basically uh, almost day one uh, when we started there. And I ran the mortgage desk for a while. Uh, I did the first subprime deal which was actually a fine idea until it wasn't years later. But basically what I was trying to do is, is find where securities or risks were mispriced in the market and create opportunities either for speculation or for hedging for our clients. 
Now, before we move on to our usual laundry list of macro topics, I want to start with your theory about the relationship between rates, credit, and volatility, because that seems to be kind of the center of your work. So referring to slide five in the slide deck, and listeners, you can find the link to download the slide deck in your research roundup email. If you uh, are not yet registered, just look for the looking for the download button next to Harley's picture on our website. Looking at slide five, why don't you give us the whole backstory here? What is your theory about rates, credit, and volatility? Well, I'd say as, as a preview, I'm a, a, a U Chicago MBA. So I guess I believe in efficient markets to the extent that they are uh, reasonable and realistic. And I believe that all things uh, basically uh, kind of correlate through time. Uh, efficient markets don't mean, don't mean things happen immediately, but they happen eventually. Uh, and this you know, pervades all my views of uh, pricing, investing, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, you have your three main risks duration, credit, convexity. And in theory, if there was some giant supercomputer allocating portfolios, they would look at those three risks and say, where's the best value? Where's the best risk adjusted return for those three? And um, as one got cheap, another one would get would follow along and, and, and go with it. Um, this chart here shows basically duration being measured as the yield curve, right? To think about the yield curve, in this case, uh, you know, twos, tens, it's saying to, to the extent that it becomes steeper, it means the forward rate is more distant from the spot rate. It's just a pure mathematical function. Uh, and a flat yield curve, so a 5% two-year, 5% 10-year, then your forward rate's 5%. But if you have a 2% two-year and a 5% 10-year, your forward might be 6%. So therefore, there's, there's implied movement because unless time can go backwards, which it can't, this spot must become the forward. So therefore, the steeper or actually more inverted, either way, uh, as long as it's not flat, uh, the more slope there is to the curve, the more uncertainty there is in the future about whether rates are going to move up or down. Along with that, volatility, which is the price of uncertainty, the price of risk, should tag along with it. And in this chart, you can see uh, it, it does. I don't have the chart with me, although it is uh, in my, uh, my website. Uh, there's a, a fine chart of yield curve versus credit as measured by any of your standard credit indices uh, or CDX swaps, and it follows right in lines. All three of them follow each other up and down on a macro basis. A micro basis, I would recommend this because you could have a lot of wiggle room uh, over the course of time, but in the big picture, uh, these things follow. Let's tie this into a subject that a lot of people are thinking about, which is this uh, suggestion that's been made that the 35-year bond bull market is finally over and that last year we saw the final low in 10-year yields. What is your reaction and how does that tie into your theory here? Well, I tend to believe that uh, prices uh, are supply and demand. Uh, that's, that's fairly simple. But what's been going on for the last 40 years really is a demographic story of the market, the U.S., the world, really, Western society, digesting the baby boom generation. And if you look at the bull market we had in stocks, really kind of lines up with when the baby boomers in 1980 were becoming 30 years old and becoming their most productive and working the most hours and were entering the labor force. So you had this huge growth of people in the economy. Uh, and this went for 20 years as the boomers went through. The boomers are now uh, are retiring. And they're retiring at a faster rate than the millennials are coming in. And so in that sense, you kind of have a, a reverse going on. And if you look at the boomers who are average age 62 right now, what is their kind of, I don't want to say goal, but what are they kind of thinking about? They're thinking about, I have to retire. I have to pay for the retirement. I'm going to live a lot longer than my parents did. And I really can't rely upon Social Security, the government, and other things for, 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 for my uh, retirement. So they're going to start to go and basically buy debt buy bonds, buy cash flow, as opposed to buying uncertainty, which is an equity. I'm not saying equities are better or worse. They're just less certain. And so uh, I think what you've seen going on here is a lot of it is um, perhaps government policy, perhaps reduced productivity for various means, perhaps regulation. The overriding force, the 90% the of the iceberg under the water is just pure demographics of boomers retiring and millennials not coming in that fast. And so if you look at page two, you can see this declining labor force growth rate. And my suspicion is you're going to see interest rates, Fed policy or not, government policy or not, stay relatively low uh, until about 2023, 4, 5, 
when you see this turn up uh, in labor force growth rate. Because remember, what is your, your GDP in the end? It's number of people times number of hours times productivity. Productivity has really not been increasing at all. Actually, it's been decreasing for the last few years. And um, if you have a declining number of people, you're not going to get growth. So it's, it's just that simple. A plus B equals C. And on slide three, you're showing that uh, correlation between the 10-year yield and labor force growth. So I guess the question becomes, does this demographic issue with the baby boomers mean we're going to continue to see labor force not growing? Or potentially is some of that cyclical economic factors that might turn up to our advantage here? Well, looking at, at charts three uh, and chart four, but chart three first, and thank you, Gerald Minnick, for his chart here. This is, basically shows your labor force growth versus the 10-year rate, you know, going back uh, 50, 60, 70 years. It's not a perfect chart, but it kind of tells you the picture. And also, you can see where I mentioned in the prior chart about where the, the upturn in rates happen. If they're going to go up, they're going to go up then. If inflation is going to come back, it'll come back then. And uh, I would... Uh, predict for the record, you will not see the cash tenure note above three and a half percent of the next five years uh, for these reasons, uh, almost irrelevant to any government policy. And if you look at uh, slide four, uh, this participation rate, which people are crying that uh, it's about regulation and about this and about that and government policy. No, it's really about just pure demographics. We're pretty close to what uh, is predicted by just boomers retiring. And I assume that the 2022, 20, 23, 24, that's when the next generation, uh, generational wave comes through and the millennials start to move into having more money and, uh, and investing more? Precisely. I mean, the millennials will, will be entering the workforce. They'll be in their most productive years, ages 30 to 50. There'll be uh, household formation. I mean, there is, you know, uh, the, the, the small fact that uh, uh, household formation is starting later than it used to because people get married later than they used to. People get married later than they used to. So the, the, the difference between these red and blue lines really is more a, a little bit of just a, our society and people getting married later for various reasons. I, I don't see why it's going to be different. People who form households and have children need to buy washers and dryers and cars and fix their houses and everything else that we do. Just a minute ago, you touched on inflation, which was going to be my next question. Do I understand correctly, if I, if I summarize what I think I heard, it sounds like we don't see higher yields or a resurgence of inflation until we get to the next wave and until we get through this baby boomer retiring wave and into the millennials coming into their, their highest earning years. Is that right? As I said, I'm a UChicago MBA. I don't think it's possible to pump $4 trillion dollars in the U.S. or $20 trillion in basically a you know, G4 Western society without getting inflation. Uh, you can't print money faster than overall growth of the economy uh, without getting inflation. If, if it was the case you could do that, that over the course of the last 5,000 years, somebody might have actually invented the idea of printing whatever the coin of the realm is, rocks, shiny stones, sticks, whatever that might be, and giving them to the people, and then everyone is no longer poor. Uh, the fact that I haven't read about that yet uh, indicates either it never happened or maybe it did happen 3,000 years ago when it was recorded in the uh, Library of Alexandria and burned down, but I think I would have read about this. The fact that we have that inflation doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It just means that it takes a longer process to occur. Uh, the inflation of the uh, late 70s was Johnson's guns and butter as well as demographics hitting at the same time. I don't see why that won't happen again a little later on. One could The, the, the classic counter-argument of inflation is look at Japan my pushback on that is not that governments, the idea of Japan being that a government cannot create inflation, which is kind of pushback on Milton Friedman. Uh, I would say about Japan, it's, it's, uh, Japan is not proof that you can't do it, but Japan's proof that you can try hard enough. Because the moment they did try hard enough about five years ago, uh, the yen kind of depreciated by 50%. Um, you've seen what's happened there. So if, if you try hard enough, you could do it. Uh, the real question for the Fed, or for government policy in general, it is not creating inflation, but creating moderate inflation. Uh, creating 10, 12% inflation is pretty easy. I mean, look at Zimbabwe. You could do that, but of course, you destroy a country. The hard part is creating 2 and 3% inflation, getting right in the middle, which is what the Fed's trying to do. And that's a challenge. 
Let's move on to the stock market, Harley. One of the things that all of the bears have been saying is, you know, look at the CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio that Robert Schiller famously uh, crafted. And people are just saying, look, it, from any reasonable measure, we are at ridiculous nosebleed levels in the stock market. It's it's time for it to crash. I think you've got a different view and perhaps see some shortcomings to the design of the CAPE ratio. Please elaborate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to challenge uh, Professor. Schiller on, 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 on any of his work per se, uh, clearly one of the most qualified people in the world to go and opine about this. Nonetheless, uh, I think what he's missing here is an input for interest rates. And I guess the pushback from that side has been that there's no reasonable correlation of interest rates to CAPE to stock market performance. Uh, that doesn't quite convince me, seeing as we have a relatively short period of window we're looking at. I think any reasonable person is going to say, okay, I have a pile of money in front of me and I want to invest it somewhere because I'm not using it tomorrow because all money is a, is a store of wealth, a store of future spending. So I want to put it somewhere. I'm going to have opportunities to go and do things. I could do it in, in equities. I could do it in debt. I could do a lot of things with it. If, if debt, which is a sizable size of the, of the investment universe, is a possibility and options to, to invest, why wouldn't someone look at that and say, well, I could earn this on debt or that on equity. What am I going to do? PE is your inverse equity return. And so if uh, rates are at 1% and you could earn four or five points over that in equity, you know, unless you think vols are going to be radically higher, what's wrong with that? Uh, I think this whole thing ties into what the Fed's whole plan was. I think the Fed did a fine job uh, in, I guess, saving the world. They went and, and printed money. The plan was to reduce the front end rate by interest, rate, interest rate policies, pull the back end down via QE, and then reduce volatility via uh, uh, you know, moral, moral suasion, uh, Fed speak. And as you reduced all your safe investments, treasuries, mortgages, swaps, futures, money had to go somewhere else, and it went to riskier assets, equities, junk bonds, real estate, art, gold, whatever it might be. And, and the logic is, once again, your Chicago background, MV, money times velocity, equals PQ, price times quantity, equals GDP. They took the M up, right, by a lot. Uh, the V went down, um, too bad. And so their problem was, how do they get that V to maybe not go up, but at least stop going down so the increase in M would push on through to GDP. And uh, this was the purpose of QE is, is, is if you take rates down enough and short low risk investments down enough, the people will move their assets around. And the hope was that asset velocity, i.e. moving money from bonds to stocks or risky assets, would create monetary velocity. That was, that was the master plan. It kind of worked. I mean, we got stocks up and, and, and credit tighter, but it really didn't increase monetary velocity. So in that sense, it's been flawed. And of course, there's been a small public policy problem of the benefits of this policy accrued to people who owned assets, uh, which tend to be the wealthier people, uh, as opposed to the middle class. So I would say it, it, it kind of worked, but, but kind of didn't work. And I, I think you could probably look at today's policies and politics and kind of see the result. Another concern about the stock market that some people have voiced, and one that I, I tend to give a little bit more credibility to than the, the CAPE argument, is so much of this rally has been fueled by corporate buybacks, basically corporations borrowing in the junk bond market, using the money to buy their own shares rather than investing in the growth of their business. Moving on to slide six in your slide deck, you've got a chart here showing us buybacks and the very strong correlation between that activity and cumulative flows into equity funds. So do you think that buybacks are the principal driver of this market and what could go wrong? I mean, at some point, if interest rates go up, I would assume that that has to slow down. Flip that question for a second. Let's look at chart seven, which basically proves my point about the baby boom demographic moving out of riskier assets to safer assets. And so this chart here, thank you, Bank of America, uh, basically shows you um, retail investing in equity and in bonds. And despite this massive bull market over the last nearly decade, there's been no net money going into equities from retail people, mutual fund investors. It's all going into bonds. And this makes sense. If you think about the classic, you know, retail stockbroker rule, you put your age into bonds. 
So if you're 70 years old, you put 70 percent bonds, 30 equity. If you're 25 years old, you put 75 equity, 25 bonds. And, and you see the ads on TV, you have 10,000 people retiring every day. There is a natural slow process of money moving out of equity and into bonds, not because people are bullish or bearish, but because they're just getting older. I would not advise my 85-year-old mother to have all of her money invested in Google, despite the fact it's probably a good investment. Uh, that's just what you do. And so if you go back now to slide six, what you see is the primary, the net buyer of, of almost all equities over the last uh, five, six, seven, eight years has been from corporate stock buybacks. I don't think the risk is higher rates per se that will change this because I don't think, as I said before, rates are going to get high enough up. You're not going to see a 6% tenure or 5% fund rate. I, I think you're going to cap out at three, you know, ish, maybe. What would be a problem is uh, tax policy. It comes to pass that they uh, change the regs so borrowed money at the corporate level is no longer tax deductible. Well, that would massively alter the um, uh, capital asset you know, allocation process uh, for, for, for firms. And it may not be as interesting to go and uh, borrow money to buy back their stock. So I'd put that as one of the three. Uh, if, if I'm worried about one of the three things happening in, in the world, tax policy is one of them. You mentioned earlier that you don't think governments really can do much to increase rates in this environment, but at the same time, you also said that a resurgence of inflation in the next few years was actually likely because all of the money printing that's occurred with quantitative easing. So does that mean that we're looking at a negative real yield environment, and, and what does that mean for precious metals, particularly gold? Well, uh, if you use an interesting word, uh, usually when you talk about few at, for, for an FOMC meeting, if it means like two or three, I would think about few being right now more like five or six as far as when you'll see inflation occurring again, because that's when the inflection point of labor force growth starts to turn over. That notwithstanding, bringing up gold, oh, geez, um, I'm not a gold bug, although I guess if I had a few cocktails, I might get closer to it. Uh, as I wrote about one of my favorite pieces, uh, Rumpel Stilskin at the Fed, on my site, Warren Buffett, notwithstanding he's the richest guy in the world, is wrong about gold. Gold is not an asset. Gold's not, you can't compare gold to, uh, to, to owning shares of Exxon or owning acres of farmland. Uh, gold is an alternate currency. And to that extent, uh, and, and it qualifies as a currency under you know, the, the, all the various you know, ways we, we think about it. And... Um, if Western currencies are being debased by money printing, at some point one might want to own something that has limited ability to expand in quantity, which is gold. Bitcoin, which you did not ask about, but I'll say it anyways, I, I, I think it's tulips, man. I don't understand the idea. I, I get alternate currency. I believe in that. Uh, I believe in diversifying your, 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 your savings. But Bitcoin doesn't qualify to me because it can be created in any quantity you want, and I would not call it secure exactly. I mean, if, if, if the Russians uh, can hack into our elections and the North Koreans can hack into Sony, I suspect somebody can hack into Bitcoin also, uh, notwithstanding blockchain being, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. Let's move on to another subject that has gotten a lot of attention lately, which is risk parity strategies. You know, supposedly you have the right allocation to both stocks and bonds, and because they're inversely correlated, nothing can go wrong. Uh, what could go wrong? Well, there's a few things here we could, we could think about. I'm referring to uh, one of my write-ups recently, uh, Rambling uh, at the Edge, I think what's happened in the last 10, 15 years, the, the biggest concept has been the flow of active to passive money. And it kind of makes sense because basically money managers haven't beaten the index for quite a while. And so why should you pay higher fees and not make money? You might as well pay Vanguard you know, a dime or so, and uh, basically get the index and, and not worry too much. In line with that, you've seen risk parity, which is you buy stocks and bonds because they're self-hedging. Along with that, you've done things like uh, low volatility portfolios. All of these strategies have a common theme, which is too technical for this call, is that they're effectively selling optionality. They're creating short convexity profiles. Now, this is done quite well in the last five years as vol's gone straight down and we're at the lowest readings of the VIX, I, I mean, forever. I think I saw of the, of, the, of the 50 lowest VIX days, 30 of them have been in the last you know, few months. Um, so if you've been in a short convexity, short vol, a short optionality 
profile, you've done well. So yeah, they, they've all done well. The problem is, is people in general don't appreciate the risk profile of short convexity. Risk profile is that as things get worse, they get worse at an accelerating pace. So for example, if you own a stock that goes down a point, you lose a point, goes down one more point, you lose another point, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you're at short convexity, first you lose a point, then you lose two points, then you lose three points. That's not quite right, but it catches the idea is that things go against you, things go against you at an accelerating pace. What worries me is that if you have this broad swath of the population invested in these various short convexity profiles, I'm not sure that they are prepared for the mark to market risk of if things go south and vols go up and the portfolios go down at an increasing rate. And that worries me. And I think this is very similar to portfolio insurance. These ideas like portfolio insurance didn't cause the crash of 87, they just made it worse. Your various uh, mortgage structured assets didn't cause the problem, they just made it worse because the market was short convexity. So I tend to, and I tend to think that most great losses uh, on Wall Street or finance come from short optionality as opposed to some other risk vector because of the nonlinearity of the payoff profile. So that's my worry. And if you go to page nine, what you kind of see here is why risk parity worked or has worked since the Fed began financial repression and why it may turn around. So this is the correlation of the returns of the stock market versus the returns of the bonds of yield. And what you see is when financial repression started, 07, 08, 09, this correlation kind of stocks up bonds down. Prior to that, there was no correlation. So I kind of think that this good feeling of this hedging process working is a function of the Fed, not a function of economics. And what is more frightening is that if you go to slide 10, in theory, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're seeing stocks up bonds down. But on the macro level, we now have stocks and bonds almost at the forever highs. And so I think the next big risk will be that stocks and bonds both go down at some point. How it happens, unclear. But, but this is what I'm kind of thinking about how, how it might play out. And one of three things will then drive that, uh, either immigration policy, trade policy, or tax policy. One of those three things will be the, uh, the trigger for this. That brings to mind another kind of thought experiment that I've been struggling with, which is, as we've discussed off the air, there's this tremendous popularity these days with the short VIX trade where people are really just capturing contango yield. It's not really a speculation on a changing VIX. It's a speculation on the term structure of VIX futures. It seems to me that if that makes cheap tail hedges available to institutional investors, if that's who's on the other side of the trade, doesn't that kind of give free license for those investors to use a lot more leverage because they can buy the hedges? And, you know, what could go wrong if eventually that leverage has to be unwound? Um, a lot's been written about the VIX. One, it's general level. Two, what it actually means to vol for be it, you know, eight, nine, 10 uh, versus historical, you know, 16, 17%. Uh, percent. I, I think the buyers of the VIX, because you cannot buy the VIX, you can buy futures on the VIX. And the, the problem with these buy the VIX products is the negative carry in them is kind of hidden. It's not like an option where it takes time decay or, uh, you know, a, a stock that you, that with a dividend is less than the, your bank rate. Uh, it's kind of a hidden process. And the sellers, recognize this negative carry and they're realizing it. Uh, how it plays out, it's unclear. You, I mean, to some degree, you're picking up pins from a steamroller. On the other hand, you know, Fed policy is not changing anytime soon. So it's, uh, it's, it's unclear to me. I, I'm uncomfortable with the, I mean, the, the comfort of the sellers of the VIX products is that the term structure of the futures is very steep. And so they're earning a pretty penny while this is, uh, is happening. And so they're taking advantage of people who were buying the VIX for whatever various reasons it might be. I, th I think there's other products out there that are a better hedge vehicle than buying the VIX. So I, 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 that's kind of where I'd leave it. Before we close, I'd like to touch on your website because you've got some fantastic free content there that I know is going to interest our listeners. We have linked in the Research Roundup email that went out with this episode several articles, and there's quite a few more that we didn't link. But why don't you give us just an overview of what our listeners can expect to find from your commentary called How High is High? 
<laughs> how high is high is really, um, it's written a few years ago, but it, it hasn't really changed. It's just the underlying support for the notion of why rates can't go up by that much. And it has to do with labor, has to do with productivity. And so uh, it's kind of the fundamental uh, support of that idea. And also the idea of why you'll see higher rates, you know, six, seven years down the road. But that's, uh, that's kind of where that is. I mean, the, the, where your listeners, a lot of this writing is what I did over my career. Much of it was trade focused to go and encourage clients to go and uh, make certain investments. But a good number of them was just basic, almost educational. There's, there's no trade at the end. It's just a thought piece about an idea uh, and a way to explain the investing process. And that's uh, in the section called the Maven's Classroom. Um, and that, uh, I, I recommend your listeners go, go look at that. And that, that covers a wide variety of various ideas. Uh, the most, my most recent piece uh, that I put out uh, last week deals with more efficient ways to buy stocks for non-institutional people using the option market. It, does, it doesn't change your risk. It's just, a, it's just a better way to go and execute the same risk. And you also have a 2017 model portfolio commentary. Is that basically just suggesting a model portfolio for investors for this year? And is it still current? Um, well, I will tell you that, that that model portfolio is pretty close to my personal portfolio. Um, I, I have the ability to invest in all these kinds of products. Most of these products uh, on there uh, are institutional uh, and they're not retail. Um, that said, the themes underlying them uh, have not changed too much, and, and to the extent they are, they are viable. And I think the most interesting idea right now really is on chart number eight on your packet here, the relationship between rates and uh, the dividend yield. This, this, this over here really is, is almost the, uh, the whole story behind uh, financial repression. Going back basically almost 40 years, you can see that in general, you have equities having a, um, a lower yield than bonds. And so basically, to buy an equity, you have negative carry, negative cash flow from what you could get if you bought a bond, where you have a certain, a, a sure cash flow. I would kind of think of that as a call option, right? And if you think about it, most people would think of a uh, of a stock as being a call on a company uh, where the strike price is the value of the bonds. Because if everything goes well, you make all the upside, the bondholders get back par, and if things go down, all you can lose is your investment. So you have limited loss, unlimited gain. And you should probably have to pay for that. You pay for that by getting a lower return, uh, a lower cash flow, lower dividend. Uh, here, what's happened in Europe is you now have the bond rate being zero and the dividend yield being 3.5%. So basically, you could pick up 3.5% of yield and have unlimited upside. Geez, what's wrong with that? So I'm, I'm still, um, as, as equities go, I still love uh, European equities. And uh, I've detailed in my write-up ways to go and do it via long date options. For our listeners who might want to go deeper into this subject you're describing on slide number eight, the relationship between credit volatility and rates, which of your writings on the website would be the best place for them to start? I think the ace in the hole is, um, is a nice theoretical piece. And, and, and what that talks about is um, I call it the three to one rule, which is you look at the interest you could earn on some asset versus the price of an option. And sometimes it happens that uh, an option might cost less than the interest you earn. Now, remember, the interest you earn on some asset, the net interest of what you get the coupon in versus the financing out, that's called your carry. Um, you can look at that as a forward price if you want. So if you're earning 5% and paying 4%, you're make, earning one. So an asset at 100 today, you could buy at 99 a year from now, right? There's your one point difference. When that carry gets bigger than the option cost, so if an option costs you only a half point for that particular instrument, well, you've paid a half point and the carry is one point, that's two to one ratio. Uh, I think there's a limit on that ratio to somewhere in the two and a half, two and three quarters area. And uh, whenever you have that kind of opportunity, you should go and do it. And it just links the whole concept of volatility, option price, risk, carry, duration, uh, all together. They kind of stick with each other. You, you can't get that big a divergence. And I have some nice charts there looking at a uh, carry versus volatility ratio. 
And we do have a link to the Ace in the Hole article on the Research Roundup email. And for anyone who's interested in a wealth of other free information, it's all at convexitymaven.com. Harley, I cannot thank you enough for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, what a great interview with Harley Bassman. You know, I absolutely love his stuff. When you read some of his articles as an options geek like I am, I love to read these kind of more complex things that he puts out there. Some really interesting stuff for those of you that are into that options. Now, I wanted to, though, touch on his inflation views. And obviously, it's the, it's a story that we've often heard before, this idea that eventually quantitative easing is going to lead to inflation starting to rear its ugly head. And we've had guest after guest on that. And, you know, I, I sit back and I try to mull it over when, when I hear a lot of these views. And I always find myself always pulled back to stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, Lacey Hunt. You know, I don't uh, see the same inflation risks because to me, quantitative easing is a process of almost repairing bank balance sheets. It's the process where the money makes it into the financial system and it needs to still be distributed out. And what we're seeing often, at least from my opinion, is that we're seeing that to find asset pricing. So that's, you know, finding corporate balance sheets, which use the money for share buybacks and, and corporate debt. And we see all of the asset prices, real estate, everything rising. But for real organic inflation to me, it's still a supply and demand thing. And what we're in a world today where the average consumer in the Western world is massively indebted. We have, even though in the US it's not as bad, but if you go to London, to Canada, to Australia, you're seeing historically high levels of uh, debt to disposable income. And it creates that whole balance sheet recession. And when, when we have the scenario, or even if the banks have the money to lend, it, to me, in order to create the real inflation, the wage inflation, and all of these different things, that money has to disseminate down to a consumer, and they has to then be distributed through the system to drive that price. And I, don't, I just don't think we're going to get it. I mean, I still kind of view us more in a Japan scenario, but it was interesting because when we went back to Harley here, he's kind of now thinks it's a, a demographic trend. And when, when we see that all emerge, that demographics will once again be the driver in the future. What did you take away? Well, I think that was the key point was demographics being the driver makes perfect sense at first blush, which is, okay, the big inflation that happened in the United States starting in the mid 60s had a lot to do with the baby boom generation, the biggest generation in history, reaching their prime earning and spending years. They're spending lots of money in the economy. The millennials are another large group of people in terms of headcount. And Harley says, okay, when they come of age and they're in their prime earning years, then they're going to be spending lots of money in the economy. Where's that money going to come from is my question. And the thing I go back to Neil Howe's work is the baby boomers were the most debt friendly in the sense of being comfortable taking on big debt burdens. The baby boomers were just generationally very, very comfortable with going into really deep debt. Now, of course, Time can change people, but as of now, if you look at the polls around millennials and look at the work that Neil Howe is doing, these people want nothing to do with debt. They're kind of like the silent generation that saw what happened after the Great Depression and didn't want to have anything to do with debt. So I really wonder, you know, are we going to have a large number of people in their prime earning years? Yes. Are they going to spend borrowed money like it's going out of style the way the baby boomers did at the same age? I'm a lot more skeptical about that. So I'm not sure that we're going to see it in, in the sense that he described it. All right, Eric, I want to move on. We prepared a Macro Voices slide deck that all of our listeners will find in the Research Roundup email. It's a second bullet. It's just titled Macro Voices Slide Deck for October 26, 2017. And in this chart book, we started off with a chart showing uh, the backwardation on WTI. And I sort of wanted uh, to know your thoughts on what you're seeing here on this chart. 
Well, let's start with what's going on and what people in the industry are saying. The story you're hearing is that backwardation is coming back into the market. And what that means is that it's a sign of the supply tightening and that this is a precursor of much higher front month prices. A lot of people are saying this is the signal that tells you we're headed to higher prices. Let's take a step back and explain what contango and backwardation mean in the futures market and what signal they're actually Actually telling us. It's a little bit backwards from what a lot of people think. Maybe because it's called the futures market, some people think that the market is predicting what the future price is going to be at any given point. It doesn't really work that way. The shape of the futures term structure has more to do with market expectations. And a nice easy way to think about it is this. Let's suppose you want to buy some crude oil, Patrick. Well, if the market is really well supplied and all of the dealers are sitting on a huge amount of inventory and they're paying money to store it. They might be tempted to say, Patrick, you know, if you want to buy some oil, we'll give you a discount if you take delivery on it right away, because we want to get this stuff out of here. We don't have enough room in our storage tank. So that means that the near delivery contract, the front month, as it's called, is going to have a lower price than the subsequent contract. And the contract after that is going to be even higher priced and so on and so forth. So each subsequent delivery month later in time has a higher price. That's called contango. And that exists when the market is well supplied, there's lots of oil in stock. Now, if you get to a situation where there's a shortage and we don't have enough oil and those storage tanks are almost empty, now the dealer's in a very different circumstance. What he's feeling like is, boy, you want to buy some oil? Well, if you could wait a few months to give us time to produce more, we'll give you a discount for doing that. But if you want to take immediate delivery, we're going to charge you top dollar because we've barely got enough. That condition is called backwardation, where each subsequent contract month is priced lower than the one before it. Now, what everybody is getting all excited about is they're saying there's backwardation in the WTI term structure, and this means that there is essentially a tightening of supply, and it's going to lead to much higher prices. Let's look at this chart, the first chart in the post-game chart book that you mentioned before, linked in the Research Roundup email. For anybody who's not registered yet, you can register at macrovoices.com. Look for the uh, red button on the homepage that says looking for the download. You'll find the instructions there. If you look at this chart, each one of these dots shows you the price of WTI crude oil. That first leftmost dot would be the December of 2017 contract. That is what we call the front month. It is the current contract being actively traded. The next one is January of 2018. That's at a higher price. Then comes February at a higher price, and then March, and then April, each at higher prices. Why are those prices higher? Because we don't have backwardation at the front end of the term structure. We have contango, and we have that contango situation because there's a lot of oil in storage. This market has plenty of inventory. Nothing is in shortage in the tanks. Now, what people are saying is they're saying, yeah, but look at how it reverses over into backwardation. That means there's tightening of supply. I disagree with that. The, what means that there's a tightening of supply is when you have backwardation at the front of the curve. Well, how do I explain then why the prices are so depressed starting after June of 2018, going all the way to about December of 2021, which is the very bottom of this term structure chart here? Well, the reason is, I think, because the shale producers know that if they can sell the back end of the curve, the, the futures that are two years forward, for more than $50, they will do so. So as we've seen the geopolitical tensions in Kirkuk, Iraq, and, and so forth, resulting in the front month going up in price, even on days when there's a substantial rally upward price movement on the front month, we're seeing on the very same day those 2020, 2021, 2022 futures prices are going down in price on the same day the front month is going up. How's that possible? The front month is pulling the whole curve up higher. The back end gets above 50 bucks and the shale guys say, hey, at 50 bucks, we can lock in a profit 
If we sell that there, we know that we can drill our wells and we'll be able to be profitable. Now, I'm leaving a lot of complexity out of this for the sake of a simple explanation. Shale producers don't actually hedge anything directly in the futures market. Shale producers make a deal with an investment bank that is essentially guaranteeing their prices at the wellhead. It's the investment bank then that has to figure out how to lay off that risk that they've taken on, and they do that by selling in the futures market. So it's an indirect transmission mechanism, but the net result of producer hedging, which is a deal they make with their investment banker, is that those bankers in turn are laying off risk in the futures market about two years out. And that's exactly the reason. That selling pressure is what I'm convinced is why we have all of this deep depression in prices. Now, I'm not going to call it a backwardation like everybody's calling it. If you look to the left side of this chart where you see the stream of prices, it's all going downhill. That's backwardation. Well, what it's doing is it's getting pulled down where those three red arrows show that selling pressure two years out. After the hedging window, because that's where the shale guys need to hedge their risk, is about two years out. After that, we've got contango all the way out to 2025. Is anybody talking about how there's contango all the way out to 2025? No. No, they're only looking at the front side of the term structure, and they're getting all worked up about how they think this backwardation means something profound. I think it means the opposite. I think that producers are hedging very aggressively here because although they don't try to call a market top, they know this is a point where if they start hedging here above 50 bucks at the long dated months, we're at 52 in change, almost 53 today on the front month, but two years out, we're still right around 50. That's where they can sell those two years out futures in order to lock in prices that allow them to be profitable and to drill more shale wells. The result of drilling those shale wells is going to be more production, and that's going to bring prices down, not up. So the way that I respond to what I see in this term structure is it is a precursor of prices on the front month coming down over the next year, not going up. I don't interpret this as backwardation between June of 2018 and probably around December of 2020. I don't think that is the traditional argument of backwardation means tightening supply and, and higher prices. I think that means that the hedgers are selling the heck out of the middle of the curve. And two years out is a place where there's not a lot of natural buyers. Consuming hedgers, that's refineries, they, they generally own only hedge about a year out. So the buying pressure is much closer to the left side of the chart here. Now, Patrick, this relates very closely to the next subject that I want to discuss, which is the Brent WTI spread. What you'll hear people talking about, including journalists who are supposed to know better, is they'll say WTI, that's the U.S. oil price, is more than $6 discounted to the world oil price, the Brent contract. That means you could take oil that's sitting on the coast of Louisiana and put it on a ship and send it over and deliver it into the Brent market and you'd make a $6 arbitrage. That's simply not true. The big spread exists not between U.S. like Louisiana and the Brent price. The Brent price and the Louisiana light sweet price are almost identical, which is amazing. The huge gap in price is between Cushing, Oklahoma, WTI, and LLS, which is the Louisiana light sweet. About halfway between is the WTI that's already in Houston. So this big spread is not about a difference between the U.S. and Europe. This is a big spread that's about the difference between Cushing, Oklahoma, which is landlocked, and the Gulf Coast, which is not. Now, just a few years ago, back around 2011, the pipelines that used to carry uh, imported oil that was coming into the United States from the Middle East from the Gulf Coast up to Cushing, Oklahoma, those pipelines were all reversed. So they carry oil from Cushing, Oklahoma down to the Gulf Coast. I think that what we're seeing here and what this WTI Brent spread is really telling us, Patrick, is that those pipelines are now at maximum capacity and because they can't pump any faster, the prices for access to those pipelines are going through the roof. What that says to me is we're going to continue to have storage challenges. Now, people would say, what are you talking about, Eric? Storage challenges. You've got, look look at the massive drawdown. You just had Art Berman on your program a week ago talking about the massive, massive drawdown in comparative inventories. 
That's nationwide comparative inventory. Look at the Cushing, Oklahoma comparative inventory and per arts graph, which you can find in last week's interview and the download associated with it. Cushing, Oklahoma inventory is on the rise. I think we are headed towards Cushing, Oklahoma storage capacity being tight. And that means that the contango, not backwardation, but contango that exists in the first several months of the term structure chart is likely to persist. I don't think it's going to go away when we get to June. I think you'll see this same basic shape to the front end of the term structure where there's backwardation six, eight months out and from there. But the first several months remain in contango. Why? Because Cushing, Oklahoma is landlocked. And I think the reason for, again, it's not the WTI Brent spread. It's the WTI Louisiana light sweet spread of being $6 or more is all about those pipelines being maxed out. They can't move the oil out of Cushing down to the Gulf Coast fast enough because they don't have enough pipeline capacity. So I really think that a lot of people have this story wrong. Now, there is a counter argument to what I'm saying, which is if you look at the Brent term structure, they do have backwardation in the Brent term structure from the first month forward. They don't have the contango here. But I think that this contango phenomenon, which is about landlocked Cushing storage, is going to persist. And everything we're seeing in the Brent WTI spread, which is really, again, a Cushing, Oklahoma to Louisiana spread of about $6, tells me that that problem is not about to be solved anytime soon. Now, Eric, in the pregame, you uh, talked a little bit about the VIX and the options as well in there. So uh, what was your thinking back in the pregame? Well, I want to come to this topic because I know that a few weeks ago, you actually met a bunch of our Macro Voices listeners. I, I know that you told me you really enjoyed that experience. And you're doing it again. You're going to Toronto. You're going to be talking about a subject that's very much on my mind recently, which is the interrelationship between volatility and the pricing of options. Because I've got this theory, Patrick, and I'd love to have you comment on it. Maybe after we look at some of the slides you're going to be presenting in Toronto, that maybe one of the things that's driving this relentless rally in the stock market is all the people selling volatility are basically supplying a cheap source of tail hedges to sophisticated investors who know that they can increase their leverage and buy even more stocks if they're able to buy cheap protection in case something goes wrong. So why don't we go ahead and go into the rest of the slide deck. You're going to be giving this presentation. They basically asked you to head up the advanced track at the TMX, which is the Montreal Exchange Options Education Day. You already did this once in Vancouver. What's the date, first of all, that you're going to be presenting in Toronto? And then go ahead and talk us through what uh, some of the material that people can look forward to seeing there is going to be. Well, absolutely. Well, first off, I wanted to just uh, do that shout out because we, I did the show uh, in Vancouver and Calgary back in uh, September. And it was great to meet so many of our Macro Voice listeners who uh, made it out there to say hello. It was great. But the show uh, is next weekend on November 4th on the Saturday. And uh, we included all the links in the research roundup as well. You can just go to the Montreal Exchange website and actually uh, register right from their site. And like you were suggesting there, I'm going to be actually speaking on the advanced stream because there's a basic stream for beginners and an advanced stream. And uh, I'm going to be during that session talking about everything from the Black Scholes option pricing model to all the Greeks like Delta, Gamma, Vega, Theta, Rose. Where we're going to talk about strategies to capture Vega and Theta. We're going to get into all sorts of volatility considerations, calculating volatility. And then we're going to do all sorts of neat strategies. Like we're going to talk about the long straddle and strangle strategies, debit spreads, calendar spreads, all sorts of neat things on there. And so what what I did was I uh, just snagged a number of the slides that I'm going to be uh, doing out there to share some of the uh, basic ideas of volatility and just so that we can have some speaking points about this. And, and it's, uh, it gives everyone an idea of what kind of uh, how the presentation is going to be flowing when, when we're out there. And uh, obviously, the first few slides on page four and five, we just talk about historical volatility and the idea of what markets look like. So when we look at chart five, it shows just an overlay of what a uh, stock that is more volatile looks like versus a stock that's less volatile. That's pretty basic stuff. Our listeners would know this stuff pretty straightforward. And what I wanted to touch on is this idea of how volatility is calculated and, and what it really means. And it's, it's about a distribution, a probability distribution that is being priced in options. 
conditions. So when we look at a volatility on slide six and we talk about very low volatile periods, it, cre it, it creates a, a probability distribution curve. And, uh, and we can calculate what is the, the market is assigning as the probability that something is going to happen in a stock over a certain period of time. So if we move on to page seven, where we actually show the standard deviations, if we had a hundred dollar stock and it's at, a, at its mean price, when we're looking at a probability distribution, let's say one standard deviation, which in this case is 25% higher or lower, it means that within a 68% probability, the option is pricing that the stock will be somewhere between $75 to $125 one year out. And if we were seeing a move to the second standard deviation, it's to within a 95% probability of it being $50 higher or lower. And then, of course, there's the real tail risk to the third standard deviation, which captures 99% of all probabilities. And so what happens is that when we're looking at a low vol period, this entire vol curve is shrunk right in. Basically, the market is right now pricing in almost no big moves, and it's a really tight range. What I want to move on is to just slide eight, where we talk about what it means when you see something like a, an individual stock have an implied volatility of 20% or the S&P 500 have a VIX of 10%. Uh, we can break that. That's a one-year time frame for that implied range. But what you can do is you can break down that implied to look at what is the expected range of even daily volatility. So uh, what we show is the calculations in page nine on how that volatility is calculated. So you can see here that if we have a 20% implied volatility on a $60 stock, we can literally divide that 20% by the square root of the number of trading days in the year multiplied by its price. And we know that its daily expected range is 76 cents. So literally, let's say weekly options and daily options or, or monthly options are all literally priced based upon these uh, implied ranges. And so this is where you have cheap options versus expensive options. And this is why, uh, you know, a lot of the really smart people that you hear about the talk about volatility where we are today, we, they call it one of the biggest mispricing in options in a long time. Because what we find is, is that the markets are at these extreme levels and yet options are simply not pricing in an expectation that there's going to be any real big moves. And so that kind of brings me obviously to that very topic you were just mentioning and this idea that there must be cheap tail risk in the markets. And I respectfully have to not disagree, but just kind of explore that, that concept in a little bit more detail because if, if in many past weeks, I've shown options charts that show the, the volatility skew. And uh, what happens is that with put options in particular, uh, there is a very fat tail to the left on those skews. Basically what means is that even though the front month or at the money options on the VIX, for instance, or on the S&P 500 options, may be showing an implied volatility of 7 or 8% or really cheap options at the money or even slightly out of the money for calls. But if you suddenly go, let's say, 10 percent out of the money. Let's say right now the S&P 500 is roughly around 25.50 and if we went let's say uh, 10 percent lower down to about let's say the 2300 level on the S&P, right now the 2300 put options out to January are being priced at an 18 percent implied vol. And if, even if you go let's say predict something even more dramatic like a 20 percent market correction, let's say the S&P dropping down to you know 2000 level or something like this. I mean the 2000 level option are right now pricing in almost a 27% implied vol. We always say in options is that the implied vol path has already been determined. Like you've, you've got this fat tail already pricing all these tail options already to much higher implieds, anticipating that if there was a very big drop that those implieds would already be skyrocketing. It doesn't mean you can't make a lot of money on these options. You can because there's also the delta benefits if the, if the price is dropping rapidly. But it doesn't mean that the tail uh, options are actually cheap because they're not. Well, Patrick, I think you make an excellent point there. I hadn't thought about the going out of the money. I was thinking that as you go further out in time, you're going to definitely be pushing up the implied vol. But you're right. As you go out of the money, which is what hedgers would do, it's, uh, it definitely takes away from my theory. But I still think if you've got all of these people, and many of them don't understand what they're doing, selling vol hand over fist through this VIX trade, I just wonder where that vol is being consumed. And is it used? 
used by somebody somewhere in order to do something that is helping this crazy market to continue to uh, march up against all odds. So if any of our listeners know of uh, where we can get an answer to that question, we certainly welcome your comments to uh, info at Macro Voices. Meanwhile, I do also want to shout out to our listeners. We normally ask you to support the show through your donations, but I know in the case of Canadians, we have to speak a different language. So you can support the show by coming to Toronto and buying Patrick a beer <laughs> because uh, he had a fantastic time in Vancouver meeting a whole bunch of Macro Voices listeners. Lucas Jaster, our uh, editor and uh, sound engineer if you feed him enough vodka he may actually share the blooper reel with you and show you all of Patrick and my mistakes that you don't hear in the edited product <laughs> from that though we are uh, pretty much out of time so we do need your help if you can help us to promote the show by telling your friends and colleagues about it share our uh, research roundup emails with your friends and by all means most importantly register your free account at macrovoices.com the number of registered users we have is the statistic that Patrick uses to negotiate to get the attention of the very best feature interview guests. The benefit to you is that you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email, which never contains any marketing or advertising. It's just a compendium of links to the downloads that go with our feature interview, as well as all of the coolest free stuff we could find on the internet each week. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's research roundup. All right, well, this week you're going to find the transcript for today's interview with Harley, but uh, you'll also find that link to the chart book that Eric and Harley discussed, uh, including the links to the articles that Harley referenced throughout the interview. There's also the link to that slide deck on options volatility that we discussed here in the post game, and including your chart on oil. As well, there's a link to uh, Kevin Muir's Macro Tourist blog article where he talked about China's Minsky Moan, and I really thought that was a really interesting piece that he wrote. As well, uh, I included the monetary policy report here and for the Bank of Canada, which uh, chose not to raise interest rates, but some really neat insights onto where uh, the Canadian economy is. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's re research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at research roundup send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. Now, if you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to MacroVoices on iTunes to have MacroVoices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. 
Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. think we're at the end game yet. Mr. Trump is, of course, alluding to being almost ready to make his choice. It seems like his style on this Fed chair thing is going to be not to choose somebody, but to eliminate people. Every day he announces another person who's not under consideration. Seems like he's getting friendlier with Janet Yellen. So, you know, I'm going to wait for the nomination to see how to play that one. I think if there's anything that would reverse this dollar breakout above the 94 handle, it would be a dovish surprise in terms of who gets the nomination for Fed chair. Remember, though, that no matter what the nomination is, a whole lot of people in Congress are going to fight any nomination from Donald Trump just because he's Donald Trump. So this could be a contentious Senate confirmation process as well. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil, where uh, once again, crude oil pushing to the top end of its ranges. It looks like that uh, 53 to 55 zone uh, where the highs of the year all were lying seems uh, a stone's throw away. What's your feeling here on oil? Yeah, well, as you called it, I think it was last week or the week before, it looks like we are probably getting that one last push up. We closed just barely above a key resistance level uh, today on Thursday, and it looks to me like we're targeting at least 53.11, if not uh, 53.76 would be the next target, and eventually you get into the 54 range. So I do think that we're probably headed towards higher oil prices. Let's start with inventory, though. Crude oil building 856,000 barrels a very small build, but a build in a week when most people were expecting a really big drawdown. Now, normally a build like that would be bearish, but look at the finished products. Holy cow, gasoline drawing down 5.5 million barrels, distillates drawing down 5.2 million barrels, and the distillates draw is particularly interesting because the distillates inventory was already critically low, so we're really getting to a supply contention problem with the marked drawdown in distillates. Remember, it is refinery maintenance season as the refineries get through their turnaround process and come back up to full capacity we should probably see some of these uh, finished products get built up again and i think that that will lead to more drawdowns in inventory cushing oklahoma drawing down 237,000 barrels this week production back up above 9.5 million barrels so we're basically fully back online recovered from the hurricanes and uh, at pre-hurricane production levels exports are back up though one 1.924 million barrels per day. Multiply by seven, you get 13.5 million barrels of oil exported. That means that this 856,000 barrel build on inventories would have been a 14 million barrel build on inventories if we weren't exporting that oil. Now, the tape action and reaction to inventory was very confused. The market didn't know what to make of it. At first, it was up and then it was down and then it jerked up and then it jerked down, then it drifted slightly higher and then it drifted slightly lower. But eventually the resolution to that was we ended up in the last couple of days trading higher. There's two more important issues about crude oil that are going to take some time to get into, Patrick. I think that the media in particular and a lot of analysts really have the story about backwardation in the WTI term structure wrong. And the other issue is the Brent WTI fallacy that so many people are talking about. It's really not the Brent WTI spread that you should focus on. It's the WTI in Cushing to LLS spread. I want to explain what all of that means, but it's a little bit too much for our market wrap. So let's save that for our post-game segment after the feature interview with Harley Bassman. All right, Eric. Well, let's move on to gold. Uh, now, when we look at uh, gold prices, like you know, there's always that intermarket relationship of uh, against the U.S. dollar on gold. But it's amazing to me how almost every day that uh, the dollar ticks up, gold ticks down, or vice versa, almost to the T. And obviously, with the big U.S. dollar break uh, out on the upside, that gold is once again under pressure to the bottom in the range. Where does gold look like it's going here for you? 
Well, I think you pretty much said it. What we're seeing is that very strong inverse correlation holding true. You know, we talked to Raul Paul six, eight months ago about a theory that maybe we could see the unusual circumstance where gold and the dollar rally at the same time. That We're not seeing that. What we're seeing is that as the dollar rallies, gold is taking it on the chin. I don't think that there's a play here to go long gold unless you have an opinion for some reason that you really expect a downside side surprise on the dollar index. With this kind of strength on the dollar, I'm holding off. I would like to buy gold. I think that the the day for gold is definitely coming, but I think we may have another big move down before we get to a a low, maybe even down to a a new lower low. What was the prior low? 1,025. We might even get below 1,000 if this dollar rally continues in earnest. I'm waiting to see, as far as I'm concerned, the jury's out on the dollar. I'm waiting to make a decision on gold until after I see what the dollar does. All right, well, let's move on to treasury yields, where for the last six months, you know, that 240 level has actually been an overhead resistance. The May high, the July highs were all in there. And suddenly we get this big breakout in yields now, uh, you know, pushing north of 245. What's your thinking here on yields? I'm guessing that this has to do with speculation about who gets the Fed chair nomination. And that is a guess. I don't really have any strong opinion or reason to think that has to be it. But as I look around trying to come up with another explanation, This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 86 was recorded on October 26, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Convexity Maven founder Harley Bassman is probably best known for being one of the principal inventors of the Move Index, which is essentially the VIX for the bond market. Harley joins me for this week's feature interview, in which we'll discuss everything from Harley's thesis about the interrelationship between rates, credit, and volatility, to demographics, to the eventual return of inflation in coming years, and much, much more. Be sure to stay tuned, though, after the feature interview for our post-game segment, in which Patrick and I will provide extended crude oil market coverage, as well as getting into detail on some more option strategies. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 made a, a yet again an all-time new high earlier this week, but it seems to have rolled over in the last 48 hours. What's your thinking here on equities? Well, to be sure, a pullback of some kind is way overdue. And of course, there's a lot of people talking, saying, okay, the crash is on. It's possible, Patrick. You know, it is October, I suppose. It could still happen. But as I've said before, I think that the odds of a crash happening when so many people have predicted it is unlikely. I think a much more likely scenario is that there's no crash in October. And just as people are jumping for joy and celebrating that it was a false alarm, that's when something goes wrong. So, uh, you know, anything is possible. This was only, what, about a 1% pullback so far? And I guess we'll see what happens. But something I have been thinking about relative to this market, you know, we don't see any pullbacks hardly at all. And the market seems to be just going straight up in a straight line. How's that possible? Well, we've talked quite a bit on the program about this VIX short trade that everybody from the waitress at the uh, Applebee's restaurant to uh, the, the retired target manager who wants to start a hedge fund is is in. Think about what happens with that trade. All these people are shorting volatility. They're selling VIX futures and they're taking advantage of the contango yield by rolling those futures contracts forward. Or if they're doing it in the ETF, they're just letting the ETF do that contract roll for them. So the number is not changing so much. It's not like the number on the VIX is going down. It's capturing that term structure contango that's allowing that trade to profit for so many people. Well, what does that do? It creates this artificial massive supply of volatility, which you know, Patrick, is the key ingredient to options trading. So it makes me think about, is it 
possible that all these people selling the VIX short are basically suppliers of volatility that's creating cheap tail hedges that are allowing institutional investors to justify using much more leverage. And if you think about it, that would explain why we see this market continue to just march higher and higher if we have a lot of institutions and hedge funds that are suddenly comfortable using more leverage because they can buy the hedges they need in order to offset that leverage risk uh, at a cheaper cost because of all this cheap vol that might explain this of course the unwind of that would look really ugly we're getting a little bit technical here for our market wrap so i'd like to come back to this subject with you patrick in the post game segment because i know that you did a presentation in vancouver a few weeks ago where you were getting into exactly this relationship between the volatility that's expressed by the vix and the cost of options so let's save that for post game i know you're going to be doing that again in Toronto, and by all means, anybody in Toronto in particular, don't miss the post game this week where we're going to get into more detail on what Patrick is going to cover at a conference there in the next couple of weeks. Aside from that, you know, I, I guess I'll just leave it on this point that I've made before. The stock market likes to make wise men look like fools, and I think that when we get to the point that the people who have expressed doubt about this market are being ridiculed publicly, and everybody becomes so complacent that it just has to go higher, that's when I really get scared. But I don't think we're quite there yet. All right. Well, let's move on to that dollar index. And all I have to say is thank you, Mario Draghi, because that dovish taper uh, announcement uh, shot that US dollar index higher here as the euro started plummeting. What's your take here on the dollar index? Well, not only did we get a spike up, but it took us very decisively through that head and shoulders, or I should say inverse head and shoulders neckline just above 94. So now we have, uh, unless there's a sudden retracement, which is possible when something like this happens on news, we've got a confirmation of that inverse head and shoulders pattern that should target probably up 96, 97, something like that. So far, you know, we're tracking on the story that I have favored, which is I think that we are going to see a resumption of the secular bull market. I think that the Luke Gromans and the Mark Yuskos of the world are definitely going to be proven right in the end. I just don't think for what's driving this, what is it, 10 basis points in the last uh, week or so higher in yields. That's all I can come up with. We are still comfortably in that trading range, though. If we start to go above two spots, 64 on the 10-year yield, that tells me that maybe a new trend is in play. But at this point, I, I think we need to wait and see who gets the Fed nomination and particularly how the market reacts after that Fed nomination first. And then the next round is when we find out whether or not the nominated person is going to easily be confirmed or if they're going to face a really difficult confirmation process. And I think that might not be so much about the person who gets nominated, but just the conviction of a lot of people in Congress about opposing anything that comes from Mr. Trump. All right. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. And this week's featured interview, Convexity Maven founder Harley Bassman will be joining us. Eric's interview with Harley is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Convexity Maven founder, Harley Bassman. Harley, I think some of our listeners may not be completely aware of your very extensive background in the industry. You were one of the principal designers and creators of the Move Index, which is essentially the VIX for the bond market, and held some senior roles at Merrill Lynch and PIMCO. So why don't we start with a little bit on your background and particularly how the Move Index came about. Thank you. Thank you for your time on the show. The move basically came out a year or so after the VIX. Uh, it became obvious that volatility was becoming more and more important in the bond markets. Uh, people actually thought of volatility as an asset class to some degrees. It's certainly one of the three main risk vectors being duration, credit, and volatility. I view myself as a convexity maven. Uh, I focus on volatility and that sort of risk. Duration is when you get your money back. Credit is if you get your money back. And uh, volatility, convexity is how you get it back. It's a path-dependent risk. And so creating the move was a way of basically uh, creating a a language for people to go and uh, look at volatility as an index as opposed to a number and um, say if it's high or low relative to uh, where it's been historically. 
And I believe you were at Merrill Lynch working on trading desks for about 26 years, and then you held a senior portfolio manager position at PIMCO. Tell us a little bit about what you did there at uh, the Bond King firm, so to speak. I was Merrill 26 years. Uh, it was a terrific place, uh, a lot of opportunity. And uh, I focused on, uh, I, I was on the mortgage desk and uh, from basically uh, almost day one uh, when we started there. And I ran the mortgage desk for a while. Uh, I did the first subprime deal which was actually a fine idea until it wasn't years later. But basically what I was trying to do is, is, is uh, find where securities or risks were mispriced in the market and create opportunities either for speculation or for hedging for our clients. Now, before we move on to our usual laundry list of macro topics, I want to start with your theory about the relationship between rates, credit, and volatility, because that seems to be kind of the center of your work. So referring to slide five in the slide deck, and listeners, you can find the link to download the slide deck in your research roundup email. If you uh, are not yet registered, just look for the looking for the download button next to Harley's picture on our website. Looking at slide five, why don't you give us the whole backstory here? What is your theory about rates, credit, and volatility? Well, I'd say as, as a preview, I'm a, a U Chicago MBA. So I guess I believe in efficient markets to the extent that they are uh, reasonable and realistic. And I believe that all things uh, basically uh, kind of correlate through time. Uh, efficient markets don't mean, don't mean things happen immediately, but they happen eventually. Uh, and this you know, pervades all my views of uh, pricing, investing, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, you have your three main risks duration, credit, convexity. And in theory, if there was some giant supercomputer allocating portfolios, they would look at those three risks and say, where's the best value? Where's the best risk adjusted return for those three? And um, as one got cheap, another one would get would follow along and, and, and go with it. Um, this chart here shows basically duration being measured as the yield curve, right? If you think about the yield curve, in this case, uh, you know, twos, tens, it's saying to, to the extent that it becomes steeper, it means the forward rate is more distant from the spot rate. It's just a pure mathematical function. Uh, and a flat yield curve, so a 5% two-year, 5% 10 year, then your forward rate is 5%. But if you have a 2% two-year and a 5% 10 year, your forward might be 6%. So therefore, there's, there's implied movement because unless time can go backwards, which it can't, this spot must become the forward. So therefore, the steeper or actually more inverted, either way, uh, as long as it's not flat, uh, the more slope there is to the curve, the more uncertainty there is in the future about whether rates are going to move up or down. Along with that, volatility, which is the price of uncertainty, the price of risk, should tag along with it. And in this chart, you can see uh, it, it does. I don't have the chart with me, although it is uh, in my, uh, my website. Uh, there's a, a fine chart of yield curve getting inflation. Uh, you can't print money faster than overall growth of the economy uh, without getting inflation. If, if it was the case you could do that, that over the course of the last 5,000 years, somebody might have actually invented the idea of printing whatever the coin of the realm is, rocks, shiny stones, sticks, whatever that might be, and giving them to the people, and then everyone is no longer poor. Uh, the fact that I haven't read about that yet uh, indicates either it never happened or Maybe it did happen 3,000 years ago when it was recorded in the uh, Library of Alexandria and burned down, but I think I would have read about this. The fact that we have that inflation doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It just means that it takes a longer process to occur. Uh, the inflation of the uh, late 70s was Johnson's guns and butter as well as demographics hitting at the same time. I don't see why that won't happen again a little later on. One could The, the, the classic counter-argument of inflation is look at Japan. My pushback on that is not that governments, the idea of Japan being that a government cannot create inflation, which is kind of pushed back on Milton Friedman. Uh, I would say about Japan, it's, it's, uh, Japan is not proof that you can't do it, but Japan's proof that they didn't try hard enough. Because the moment they did try hard enough, about five years ago, uh, the yen kind of depreciated by 50%. Um, you've seen what's happened there. So if you, if you try hard enough, you could do it. Uh, the real question for the Fed, or for government policy in general, is, is not creating inflation, but creating moderate inflation. Uh, creating 10-12% inflation is pretty easy. I mean, look at Zimbabwe. You could do that, but of course you destroy a country. The hard part is creating 2 and 3% inflation, getting right in the middle, which is what the Fed's trying to do. And that's a challenge. 
Let's move on to the stock market, Harley. One of the things that all of the bears have been saying is, you know, look at the CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio that Robert Schiller famously uh, crafted. And people are just saying, look, it, from any reasonable measure, we are at ridiculous nosebleed levels in the stock market. It's it's time for it to crash. I think you've got a different view and perhaps see some shortcomings to the design of the CAPE ratio. Please elaborate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to challenge uh, Professor Schiller on, 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 on any of his work per se. Uh, clearly, one of the most qualified people in the world to go and opine about this. Nonetheless, uh, I think what he's missing here is an input for interest rates. And I guess the pushback from that side has been that there's no reasonable correlation of interest rates to CAPE to stock market performance. Uh, that doesn't quite convince me, seeing as we have a relatively short period of window we're looking at. I think any reasonable person is going to say, okay, I have a pile of money in front of me and I want to invest it somewhere because I'm not using it tomorrow because all money is a, is a store of wealth, a store of future spending. So I want to put it somewhere. I'm going to have opportunities to go and do things. I could do it in, in equities. I could do it in debt. I could do a lot of things with it. If, if debt, which is a sizable size of the, of the investment universe, is a possibility and options to, to invest, why wouldn't someone look at that and say, well, I could earn this on debt or that on equity. What am I going to do? PE is your inverse equity return. And so if uh, rates are at 1% and you could earn four or five points over that in equity, you know, unless you think vols are going to be radically higher, what's wrong with that? Uh, I think this whole thing ties into what the Fed's whole plan was. I think the Fed did a fine job uh, in, I guess, saving the world. They went and, and printed money. The plan was to reduce the front end rate by interest, rate, interest policies, pull the back end down, the QE, and then reduce volatility, the uh, uh, you know, moral, moral suasion, uh, Fed speak. And as you reduced all your safe investments, treasuries, mortgages, swaps, futures, money had to go somewhere else, and it went to riskier assets, equities, junk bonds, real estate, art, gold, whatever it might be. And, and the logic is, once again, you Chicago background, MV, money times velocity, equals PQ, price times quantity, equals GDP. They took the M up, right, by a lot. Uh, the V went down, um, too bad. And so their problem was, how did they get that V to maybe not go up, but at least stop going down so the increase in M would push on through to GDP, and uh, this was the purpose of QE, is, is, is if you take rates down enough and short, low-risk investments down enough, the people will move their assets around. And the hope was that asset velocity, i.e. moving money from bonds to stocks or risky assets, would create monetary velocity. That was, that was the master plan. It kind of worked. I mean, we got stocks up and, and, and credit tighter, but it really didn't increase monetary velocity. So in that sense, it's been flawed. And of course, there's been a small public policy problem of the benefits of this policy accrued to people who owned assets, uh, which tend to be the wealthier people, uh, as opposed to the middle class. So I would say it, it kind of worked, but, but kind of didn't work. And I, I think you could probably look at today's policies and politics and kind of see the results. Another concern about the stock market that some people have voiced, and one that I, I tend to give a little bit more credibility to than the, the CAPE argument, is so much of this rally has been fueled by corporate buybacks, basically corporations borrowing in the junk bond market, using the money to buy their own shares rather than investing in the growth of their business. Versus credit, as measured by any of your standard credit indices uh, or CDX swaps, and it follows right in line. All three of them follow each other up and down on a macro basis. A micro basis, I would recommend this because you could have a lot of wiggle room uh, over the course of time. But in the big picture, uh, these things follow. Let's tie this into a subject that a lot of people are thinking about, which is uh, this uh, suggestion that's been made that the 35-year bond bull market is finally over and that last year we saw the final low in 10-year yields. What is your reaction and how does that tie into your theory here? Well, I tend to believe that uh, prices uh, are supply and demand. Uh, that's, that's fairly simple. But what's been going on for the last 40 years really is a demographic story of the market, the U.S., the world, really, Western society, digesting the baby boom generation. And if you look at the bull market we had in stocks, really kind of lines up with when the baby boomers, 
1980 were becoming 30 years old and becoming their most productive and working the most hours and were entering the labor force. So you had this huge growth of people in the economy. Uh, this went for 20 years as the boomers went through. The boomers are now uh, are retiring and they're retiring at a faster rate than the millennials are coming in. And so in that sense, you kind of have a, a reverse going on. And if you look at the boomers who are average age 62 right now, what is their kind of, I don't want to say goal, but what are they kind of thinking about? They're thinking about, I have to retire. I have to pay for the retirement. I'm going to live a lot longer than my parents did. And I really can't rely upon Social Security, the government, and other things for, 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 for my uh, retirement. So they're going to start to go and basically buy debt, buy bonds, buy cash flow, as opposed to buying uncertainty, which is an equity. I'm not saying equities are better or worse. They're just less certain. And so uh, I think what you've seen going on here is a lot of it is um, perhaps government policy, perhaps reduced productivity for various means, perhaps regulation. The overriding force, the, the 90% of the iceberg under the water is just pure demographics of boomers retiring and millennials not coming in that fast. And so if you look at page two, you can see this declining labor force growth rate and my suspicion is you're going to see interest rates, Fed policy or not, government policy or not, stay relatively low uh, until about 2023, 4, 5, when you see this turn up uh, in labor force growth rate. Because remember, what is your, your GDP in the end? It's number of people times number of hours times productivity. Productivity has really not been increasing at all. Actually, it's been decreasing for the last few years. And um, if you have declining number of people, you're not going to get growth. So it's just that simple. A plus B equals C. And on slide three, you're showing that uh, correlation between the 10-year yield and labor force growth. So I guess the question becomes, does this demographic issue with the baby boomers mean we're going to continue to see labor force not growing? Or potentially is some of that cyclical economic factors that might turn up to our advantage here? Well, looking at, at charts three uh, and chart four, but chart three first, and thank you, Gerald Minnick, for his chart here. This is, basically shows your labor force growth versus the 10-year rate, you know, going back uh, 50, 60, 70 years. It's not a perfect chart, but it kind of tells you the picture. And also, you can see where I mentioned in the prior chart about where the, the upturn in rates happen. If they're going to go up, they're going to go up then. If inflation is going to come back, it'll come back then. And uh, I would... Uh, predict for the record, you will not see the cash tenure note above three and a half percent for the next five years uh, for these reasons, uh, almost irrelevant to any government policy. And if you look at uh, slide four, uh, this participation rate, which people are crying that uh, it's about regulation and about this and about that and government policy. No, it's really about just pure demographics. We're pretty close to what uh, is predicted by just boomers retiring. And I assume that the 2022, 20, 23, 24, that's when the next generation, uh, generational wave comes through and the millennials start to move into having more money and, uh, and investing more? Precisely. I mean, the millennials will, will be entering the workforce. They'll be in their most productive years, ages 30 to 50. They'll be uh, household formation. I mean, there is, you know, uh, the, the, the small fact that uh, uh, household formation is starting later than it used to because people get married later than they used to. People get married later than they used to. So the, the, the difference between these red and blue lines really is more a, a little bit of just the, our society and people getting married later for various reasons. I, I don't see why it's going to be different. People who form households and have children need to buy washers and dryers and cars and fix their houses and everything else that we do. Just a minute ago, you touched on inflation, which was going to be my next question. Do I understand correctly, if I, if I summarize what I think I heard, it sounds like we don't see higher yields or a resurgence of inflation until we get to the next wave and until we get through this baby boomer retiring wave and into the millennials coming into their, their highest earning years. Is that right? As I said, I'm a UChicago MBA. I don't think it's possible to pump $4 trillion dollars in the U.S. or $20 trillion in basically a you know, G4 Western society without 